Let's bring our hands together for Sadie Redwing. Well, just before I get started here, um, just a quick introduction of myself. So, Hamadakiapi, Tashinaziwi, Machiapi, Naminiwakon, Yate, is where I come from. Um, quickly, I just wanted to recognize and give thanks to the Illinois and the uh, Anishinaabe tribes, um, give recognition to their land and having a chance to host this university and bring us all together for this conference. So, thank you to the guardians of the Great Lakes for bringing us all together. Um, let's see if I can get my. There we go. So just a quick introduction of myself. Um, I'm currently at the um, Indian University in North America where I teach computer science and speech. Um, I'm enrolled in the Spirit Lake Dakota Nation, which is in Fort Tot in North Dakota, um, located in around the Devil's Lake area in North Dakota. But you might hear that I identify myself more as Lakota. Um, I'm trying to get my map up on here. Um, there we go. So here on the, on the bottom red square in central South Dakota, on the Cheyenne River Reservation, that's where my family comes from. Um, I was brought up in that upbringing. I had, um, that's kind of more my, that my ideology, my thinking, that's my culture. I, I am Lakota more than I am Dakota. Um, I'm also um, an advocate for Native American students. Um, I'm ambassador for the American Indian College Fund where I really try to gain uh, greater resources for Native American students. And I notice uh, there's a lot of lack of uh, Native American students in design schools, art and design schools. So I really try to keep a voice in there, making sure that you know, in outreaching to those students, do they have what they need within classrooms? And um, if, or even too, um, similar to my workshop tomorrow, we'll be bringing in conversations of, you know, if you're working with a sensitive demographic like Native American students, um, you know, how, how can you create greater conversations without um, bringing the offense? So I will start my presentation out with this uh, image because being Native American, there's still a romanticized image, a very fantasized, made-up image of uh, what we look like as people. So I share this, this image to see um, what we look like today, because I know we really fall into the lines of um, that really uh, 19 or 1800s, early 1900s um, style choice of the stereotypes of the headdress, and I know that y'all can picture it. And I want to express this image, um, a screen cap now. I don't know if anyone here has Googled Native American graphic design, and I know that uh, the way Google's magic, everyone's gonna have different results, but I wanna bring this to attention is that when you Google Native American graphic design, like 98% of the results that come up are images created by non-Native American artists. So to reiterate that, less than 3% of actual Native American graphic designers um, or made it to the Google uh, search results. But then if Google search is such a dominant resource that we use when it comes to having images, you know, this is what we got. Um, definitely the headdresses, the Clovis points, the Navajo rug motifs, um, very, very, very stereotypical. And then also too, I always challenge and give my students a little bit of research is if you really start digging deep into these results and you start to click on some of these images, you see a lot of them come from websites like Behance or other graphic design inspiration websites. But then when you get to find who is um, actually creating those, a lot of them are graphic designers from Europe, um, a lot from France, um, Italy, and Germany, but that just also shows that there is a great dominance in who makes it to the, to the, research, the uh, search results, but also to, um, I always question why, why, is, why are those demographics really interested into making a lot of our, our artwork? So I brought a lot of that frustration into me, or in with me when I went to uh, North Carolina State, got my master's in 2016, um, and I'm just skimming over my research uh, but one thing that I wanted to do is if a lot of tribes that work with ancient visual languages, um, we're losing them. We're losing them just as fast as we're losing our indigenous languages, the verbal language, and same to go with our body language. Um, and I always believe that um, a lot of these design schools could be helping, helping a lot of these students help revive, you know, something like the visual language. So 
bringing, um, so one thing I want to point out too is when it comes to working in Native American visual languages, there has to be greater definition of the difference between Western ideology and indigenous ideology. We notice, or just from experience, and I'm very, I'm paraphrasing this, and I'm saying it really respectfully, is that within thinking of a Western ideology or doing Western research, it requires a lot of definition, a lot of facts, a lot of backing up, a lot of where you're getting these sources, very systematic. Um, so it's really hard to really be working in these visual languages when we don't have any presence in research. Like I, <laughs> it was so challenging to really f conduct actual research and looking at uh, trying to find other uh, folks who um, actually communicate in these visual languages. And a lot of that research goes into like museums or um, uh, archaeology, um, anthropology, or basically stuff that's more history related. But we need stuff for today too. So um, definitely having to open up the door of understanding that a lot of these uh, traditional visual languages, they require, they require greater appreciation. They, cry, they require a lot of greater oral histories, especially that comes from uh, elders, elders that, who do not have degrees, <laughs> that do not have PhDs, um, that come from strictly boarding school and are probably trying to survive on the reservation. But there's such a wealth of knowledge there that is not acknowledged. And one thing I want to point out too is our uh, Hawaiian relatives, um, I really, I wish I could find a chart is that they really express, there's like five levels of, of education. And then within those five le levels of education, um, that experience and wisdom should be just as great as, uh, great when you're comparing it to the education that you get within studying and, and going to school. Um, so following, following my studies at North Carolina State, I was able to bring a lot of that research in. I had an opportunity to write an article in Communication Arts. And in that article, I stressed two points. Um, this one I love to highlight is uh, Navajo photographer Dakota Mace. Um, went, uh, we were just roommates at a tribal college. I'm so proud of her because she's got two masters from the University of Wisconsin-Madison. And uh, one of her masters, uh, her senior exhibition, she did a thing called woven juxtapositions. And that woven juxtapositions is, uh, she found all the offensive urban outfitter wares and she compared them with Navajo rugs. But this one might be a little bit challenging to see from where you're sitting at. But, um, in, within this uh, piece, I really like to analyze it because it's showing cultural imagery and it's also defining a place. So she found these uh, objects that had some type of influence in the patterns that uh, related to the traditional rugs. But for this case, um, within this uh, little orange strip in, the, in this bear, she is arguing that this uh, 1800s new Mexican Navajo rug uh, influenced this design within this bear. Now, if this t-shirt is showing <laughs> imagery of a race that's tied to California, how in the hell can you represent any California tribal member with a Navajo New Mexican rug? Like, whatever you're visually communicating, it's inaccurate and you're um, kind of, um, pan-Indian, you're not giving distinct definition to California tribes. So if I was in a position to uh, redesign this California bear, I'd have to take the headdress away because headdresses come from uh, the Great Plains. The tribes in California don't wear headdresses. But also, too, I had to take away that corny Pendleton uh, miscommun mis uh, visual communication actually put tribal uh, designs from California. Now, just like me, like I'm not native to California. I had to do my research just like anybody else. I go get myself involved in the community. I get to learn the objects and get to hear stories from the actual makers and stories from the, the elders. And what I did is I swapped out the stereotype and put in the actual designs. Now, because we're so used to seeing that fantasized uh, Pendleton pattern, we're not used to seeing the beauty in some of these designs. But one thing that I really like to stress to my students is that when you're displaying visual sovereignty or giving definition to a specific tribe based on their own patterns, you're doing two things. One, 
you're giving identity to a human. <laughs> like you're actually visually showing somebody who they are as a race, which is, which is a huge power to have. And actually giving pride of somebody to be that race. And also too, you're educating outsiders of how you want to be um, visually displayed. So I always have to talk to my native students too and saying, hey, if you don't want to be represented with a headdress, you need to stop putting headdresses on things. Actually put in some of our visual language. And of course, that's going to take research as well. And the second thing that I wanted to know into that uh, article was why? Why are Native Americans so sensitive to stereotypes? Man, I get all kinds of questions about racial mascots and Coachella, and <laughs> everyone's just like, why? Like, what's the big deal? And I, I use this to iterate our history because the, our Native American history here in America, man, Americans do not want to talk about it whatsoever, so I always have to reiterate. But the main thing I want to point out in this timeline is how long, how long we were in this boarding school era, which for those who may be unfamiliar with the, the American Indian boarding schools, um, the, uh, I can't think of the gentleman's name right now, but the idea was to kill the men, or kill the Indian, save the man, literally beat our culture out of us so that we're colonized and conformed into uh, the white man's world, I'd say. So these schools um, were really abusive. And, and I have an ending on this time, or ending on this date and the period, but boarding schools still exist to today. While I was working at University of Redlands, I would go to Sherman Indian Boarding School in Riverside, California. My grandma worked at Pure Indian Learning Center for 30 years. Uh, there's Riverside uh, Boarding School down in Oklahoma. Boarding school still exists. Assimilation is still happening. Uh, people, people think that this doesn't exist anymore. So to reiterate the time, so 100 to 200 years of being in boarding school, so you have to put yourself in their shoes, like to not ever see your culture, ever, even visually too as well. And so we're getting to the 40s, 50s, and 60s. We're getting new presidents. We're getting uh, new rights. Uh, there's wars going on, and then now you're getting uh, to things like technology. You're getting the radio, then we're going into the, the Hollywood, and how Hollywood just um, was a blessing and a curse for us, those Western, those John Wayne Westerns. Um, so to be in a position of not seeing your culture for hundreds and hundreds of years, to now seeing it on the big screen, it, it's... A little, <laughs> a little bit of blessing of a curse because now when we actually get to see somebody we can identify in film, but also on the shitty side is that that image had to be super stereotypical and we still cannot get out of that image at all. And you've seen it, you know, Johnny Depp and Lone Ranger, like they're still, you know, Adam Sandler had his, had his uh, fair share of the Ridiculous Six or whatnot, but we just cannot get out of this um, out of this Western uh, phase, which is really another reason why I stress, I stress these um, of using visual sovereignty so that we can have greater representation of us. But to com to co um, combine all those years of oppression into now my generation and the younger generation, what we're calling the seventh generation, is we're really trying to fight for sovereignty. A lot of these tribes around the United States are really trying to get their sovereign rights, but honestly. We might need another 100 years or so to really get back up on our feet and heal these wounds. And it's really hard to heal these wounds when we're in a position where we're the only race in America that are confined to reservations. And we're the only race in America that requires a tribal ID to identify what race we are. And we're the only race in America that are still suggested to go to boarding schools. And we're still with others, not just us now anymore, but we're still trying to get our just basic human rights and, and just fight for things, as was mentioned earlier, for stuff like clean water. So for those who um, have, are fam or, sorry, for those who are not familiar with the, um, the Dakota Access uh, Pipeline and the fight at Standing Rock, um, there's a pipeline coming from Canada all the way down to the Gulf of Mexico. And they're wanting that first, they were routing that pipeline through Bismarck, but the people of Bismarck said, well, we don't want that pipeline. So the pipe uh, routers rerouted it and put it onto the reservation, the Standing Rock Reservation. And just um, as those who live in Standing Rock, they said, well, we don't want the pipeline in our reservation either because anything, any little crack of that oil is gonna contaminate our water and uh, we don't want to be in a position to drink that water, but 
just as it goes, like we, our treaty uh, rights are always just, um, are never acknowledged or never practiced and still people are just not hearing us out that we want clean water just like anyone else, just like Bismarck. So following North Carolina State 2016, they were putting out the call for um, protesters or prote I could say protectors um, to come and, and, and stand and try to stall, stall this pipeline for coming um, for being made. Now first, when I went there, everyone knew that I just finished with a, a degree in graphic design. So like, yeah, say, you know, let's make t-shirts, let's, let's, let's make uh, stickers, you know, let's, let's basically make it into a trend. And I was just like, ma'am, like, I'm, I just finished, like, school, like, I'm exhausted, I'm here to pray. Like, this is, this, I come from right in the Missouri River and the Bad River within Central South Dakota, and any effect in that um, water in North Dakota is going to affect South Dakota as well as everywhere around in the Midwest. So I said, no, um, give me a break. <laughs> but then I started to see the visual imagery that was coming out of Standing Rock. I started to see the stereotypes that you see on those Google research. I started to see Sitting Bull's face on everything. And I'm just like, yo, if we're calling ourselves the Chek de Shakuin or the Seven Council Fires, Sitting Bull can't represent all seven us bands of Lakota. So why, why aren't we actually showing our, our Lakota and Dakota visual languages? So I made a piece on Instagram. You'll notice a lot of my work is real novice, um, really mostly in the square formation, mostly for Instagram, because that's a lot of where my demographic is and they look at. Um, I just put a couple hashtags, uh, Mini Wichoni, uh, Water is Life, and um, it's a, the water with the sun and the, the sun in the back coming up and then the um, triangles in front of the water represent the land. And I just put like hashtag fuck the pipeline, hashtag uh, black snake killers, hashtag name, and all those hashtags and I didn't expect it to go viral. And one of the reasons why it went viral is because of the uniqueness of this. Um, it, to a point where a gentleman named Aaron Huey, he's a photographer, he runs the Amplifier Foundation, and he said, hey, Sadie, I really love your piece. Would you, you know, mind having a free download and let it be mass produced? And I said, absolutely. So for me to be in a position to see some of my work be at the Women's March in Seattle, it's his son holding um, my piece, is a huge, a huge honor for, my, for me. Um, also, too, a lot of those mass prints, they went everywhere. I got a chance to, uh, my piece got to be seen in um, New York's Grand Central Station, um, just to see, like, the populations and the bodies, like, holding and standing for a statement there was a huge honor. And I have to give a shout out to the Bay Area, to the San Francisco, especially San Francisco to Oakland area. Um, this is a city hall, or a I'm not exactly sure if it's City Hall within San Francisco, but it's a, a building within downtown that projected my piece in the stand um, for, um, for this movement. And a lot of stuff that was coming out of San Francisco's divestment and banks. So for this to be projected on downtown San Francisco has landed me an opportunity to be National Geographic, just from those hashtags. <laughs> um, and also, too, like, I, I really, I, um, I really appreciate um, the hard work that's going in, especially in that large populated area. There's a gentleman um, out of Oakland, he does the Indigenous People's Power Project, his name is Cy Wagner, and he said, hey Sadie, he's like, I saw your piece in San Francisco, he's like, I'm wondering if we can make uh, full uh, screen presses with it, with it. He said, I'm training 300 to 500 activists, and we're going to make an art tent at uh, Standing Rock, and we'd love you to contribute. And I said, absolutely, but this, and I stressed this to my students, I said, this is the first time of me seeing the importance of being a visual communicator when it comes to movements like this. Um, so that's what Sai did. He brought all those uh, folks, and uh, they set up, uh, I guess, areas to, to cut canvas and, and print on canvas, and, and to see the power, the power of uh, showing something uh, instead of actually visually saying something. My grandma always says this, and this is always a huge pill to swallow. He's, she always says, Sadie, she's like, we're very prideful people, but something we have to admit is that we're only a single water drop in the bucket. Not everybody knows the Lakota language. So as much as we're there screaming, as much as we're there praying and singing, a lot of those outsiders and people on TV don't know what we're saying. And that's, 
oh man, that hits, that hits the core. But then also too, that's the importance of needing to visually show what we're standing, what we're fighting for. And I really, uh, I'm really humbled by this because a lot of people from all over the world came to Standing Rock and all of them had a chance to select different pieces. And for those who selected mine, I'm very thankful. And now, now that uh, the camp is over with, people returned home. So now that my piece, uh, I've shown all over the world now. So to be in that position that I never thought, um, and I, I, as I mentioned, like I didn't do anything particular. I really try to stress this to my stu students too, because anybody could do exactly what I did. Um, so even if the camp's gone, uh, the fight's still not over. There's still a lot of folks um, holding down banks. I have to give a shout out to um, Red Fawn here. She is uh, a female protector. She was falsely accused of firing at a um, DAPL security and she uh, was sent to prison where she is still in today so under false charges. So I always give a shout out for her for staying strong for our sisters in there. And then also too, Banks, banks, a lot of people are still trying to hold down banks. I haven't heard, I haven't been following it a lot lately in 2019, but um, to be still be seen and still be present um, in a lot of that fight, it really, it's, it's a true blessing for myself. So aside kind of transitioning from um, a piece that really caught on to kind of show examples of my work of what I bring into my Native American graphic design classrooms, um, again, really novice, as you kind of can see, it's just a few, a lot of, um, a lot of my work is really uh, sim or symbol based, um, shape based. Uh, some of the conventions of the Lakota visual language is we have a lot of reflection and a lot of that reflection um, shares our belief of the world we walk in is just as equal to the, um, to the spiritual world. So you'll, you'll notice a lot of uh, reflection and symmetry in my patterns. But I show this piece too, the text, the mini we chosani, which just means water balances life. Um, but I really try to talk to uh, or speak to those who um, don't have Native American students in their type class and the importance of these students needing to learn type. Now I'm not, like type's not my forte, I'm not, I'm not in that area so I'm trying to round up a team, but just a means of going back to who, who's in charge of those art and design schools curriculums and who's in charge of uh, their admissions and their outreaches and if you are having Native American students in the classroom and discussing type, I like to reiterate is that we need them because we need, we're in a state of emergency of extinction here that we need dictionaries. Who's gonna make those dictionaries? You download uh, the Lakota language app, you get like five fonts. Like I need some folks to help me like build some more fonts because it does get really exhausting to really draw them out, especially when we have um, characters. A lot of the Lakota visual language uh, written out, um, has kind of more of the ABCs, but there are other tribes that have more shapes within their letters. So not even just thinking about my tribe, thinking about those other tribes that have the unique characters that you can't download or you can't get like on, that you can't really find, they had to actually hand create. Because the power of knowing font is that you get to show somebody their language and that is a huge power, and I think that power gets easily abused a lot, especially when you're working with indigenous languages, which to reiterate, there's 567 uh, federally recognized tribes, so why don't we have 567 uh, different fonts for these Native American students? And But I have to really stress is that you have to be aware of who's handling a lot of those ancient languages, so kind of putting the motivation to my students, like, we need you. We need you in these font classes, but also we have to be aware of like a lot of these classes um, don't have the resources for Native American students, so how can we change that? Just to really emphasize like the state of an emergency of us losing these languages really fast. Like we, I really, we really need to get the youth immersed, immersed of everything. So I get a lot of, people want to heckle me on, on making Valentine's Day grams, you know, saying like uh, Valentine's Day or a lot of these holidays aren't traditional Native American culture. That's true. But also when your language, verbal, visual, and body languages are dying, like we need to do what we can to put them into our youth's hands. So if I'm going to make these Valentine's Day grams, this is if you love me, you better kiss me now and put a little bit of humor in it to get these students more motivated into learning 
these things, it's really, uh, it's really a challenge, especially when the populations aren't there. So I try to share and reiterate to those that who are in these positions can uh, take, take these messages back with them so we can start creating greater space for a lot of us. Um, and again, if you get a piece, uh, a lot of people are really like the mini Wicho, or mini, mini Wichoni piece. So I did a series uh, with Dallas Gotooth um, with the mini Wichozani piece. Um, one thing I really like to stress in my, uh, that I like to do is Indigenous Peoples Day greetings. Oh man, if you get, uh, that, that's, that's going back to those Google res, uh, search results of how irritating and stereotypical a lot of those are. So why not open it up? Why can't we have 576 other types of visual languages when it comes to Indigenous Peoples Day greetings? So one thing um, that I didn't get a chance to share about our visual languages um, and a lot of our cultures that it comes from the land. This is where this, this term and this movement of decolonization comes from, but having acknowledgement of the land. So before farming came to the Midwest, um, we lived in a lot of grassland, a lot of prairie. Within that prairie, there's a lot of porcupines. So before the Italians brought or introduced us to glass, where we get into beads, before we did a lot of beading, we did a lot of quilling. So get a sense of a quill, a porcupine quill, um, very long, we'd flatten it with our teeth, and then you can only do so much with a, with, a, with a quill or a line. So we don't have a lot of perfect circles within our um, visual languages, but we have a lot of right angles or triangles, um, a lot of twists and turns. So if you can see up here, a lot of uh, the imagery reflects quill work, very uh, right angle-y. And a lot of it is, and I like to do a lot of floral. We have a lot of prairie flowers that are also dying too. We're trying to do a lot of land, uh, um, land uh, preservation too within the Midwest or within the South Dakota, the Dakotas. Um, so you can kind of see here, there's a little bit of roots and like floral within trees. A little bit hard, I'll show you on another example here. Um, but one thing I like to reiterate too, because I do get a lot of questions from researchers who uh, will see some of my work and they'll try to replicate it, but then they don't have an understanding of uh, respect of where some of these designs come from. So to put yourself, and also too, a lot of our histories of a lot of uh, backstories to these are being lost too. So I like to reiterate, like who, who's uh, trying to revive or study the understanding of how the trade routes were designed. As Lakotas, man, we were on the we we're on the trade routes too. We'd we'd walk even before we'd go down to New Mexico to steal horses from the pueblos. Like when we're on feet, we forget that we have a we have a canoe history. Like those, those rivers were our interstates. So Lakotas, we'd make it all the way down to South America and we forget. So imagine yourself, I always tell my students, imagine yourself if you're on the trade route and you're interacting with all these different tribes within the Americas and you can't speak the same languages, um, how, how are you gonna be identified? And a lot of it comes from our visual languages. So being in a position of having family designs you know, you're going, to, you're going to have a feast with another tribe within the southwest or the southeast, and if you don't have your stuff marked, <laughs> or, you're, you know, just like how uh, we did at old school, like putting a Sharpie, putting our initials in our t-shirts, like, your stuff's going to get stolen. Or if you are walking in the fine line between, like, en enemy territory or war territory, um, you're going to have to express yourself to know if you're a friend or, or recognized as a foe. Um, so to kind of explain this, this family design piece, I'm really trying to hope to gain motivation to bring some of this, or revive some of our family designs back. Um, so I had a friend, her name was, uh, her Lakota name is White Butterfly Woman, Kamimi Laskawin. And she, uh, as I mentioned, uh, there's a lot of uh, equality, so she's displayed both times. And she gave, us, she gave birth to a, a son, and her son is a blue falling star boy. So she's protecting Dawson in both worlds. Now, the, um, the father, which his name is uh, Wambli, or Eagle, uh, this is his wingspan. So Ike is carrying Mimi and um, Dawson on his back. But when some people kind of see stuff like this, they might think of like a Navajo rug. <laughs> and it, there's a lot of mix up between um, Pendleton patterns and Great Plains patterns as well. Um, I'm going to finish up on these two pieces um, here. So the World Policy Journal contacted me and they said, hey, Sadie, they be really nice of you designed a cover. We're going to um, highlight the Declaration of Indigenous People's Rights in this article. And they said, can you make us a design that encompasses all the tribes all over the world? And I was like, 
Man, like, do you know, do you know what my research is? Like, if you hear the term of like visual sovereignty, but then also I kind of looked at it as a challenge. I was like, okay, if I'm gonna be in a position to design something that's gonna speak to a lot of people all over the world, how am I gonna do it? Um, and I started to think of, you know, what what are some values of Native Americans? Going thinking about, you know, going on the trade routes and all that. And and one thing that we really like to do, and this is why I stress to my students too. So if there's one advantage that our race has over other races within this country, is that we know what a tribe is. Like we know how to work in a community and we know how to divvy up uh, duties within people. But a lot of that expresses family. So comfort, comfort, we're really good at creating family and comfort. And I know that's across the board. So I was thinking, okay, if I can design something that expresses comfort, if somebody can pick up this piece, pick up this article and see one little symbol or one little design that fits into their tribal visual language, um, then I believe that I gave them comfort. One thing that I forgot to express too is the difference between indigenous uh, ideology and Western ideology is that the term to own and to claim came with manifest destiny. We don't have a lot of those words in our tribal languages. What we have is share. So you'll notice that a lot of our designs were not just specific uh, Lakota and Crow and Arapaho and Cheyenne. No, we shared. We shared because we shared areas of the land going back to where a lot of these designs are created. So if I can express comfort in sharing, because you'll see along the corners over here, some of these designs repli uh, replicate uh, Navajo rec designs, but also maybe some Pacific Islander uh, Maori designs. Within the center here, we have um, uh, some floral designs, which are floral, are shared within the East Coast and the Midwest, or even uh, some of the lines in the sketching of uh, the Cherokee uh, pattern, or sorry, Cherokee pottery and um, their basketry, which a lot of other tribes share basketry as well, and some of these um, more uh, kind of like, if you can see, triangles and X's, kind of more of like uh, Central America, or some, a lot of uh, um, North, or sorry, a lot of Western tribes, you know, share a lot of those, um, those triangles and X's and whatnot. So to be, so if I, I, I always have mixed feelings when it comes to this because this isn't my favorite piece that I did, but also too, I don't see a lot of other people trying trying to represent Native Americans without using stereotypes. So hopefully, hopefully someone um, can, uh, I can work with somebody to learn to do that a little bit better. And I'm going to finish off on this piece. So College Horizons is a, um, it's, it's a organization in, in a um, summer program that helps Native American students get into college. It's hosted at different universities. Um, I participated at Puget Sound in 2006 and it's really been beneficial. So when they came to me to ask to make their 20th anniversary, uh, Brandy said, absolutely. But one thing that was challenging too is this concept of college. College pride, Native pride is uh, contemporary to us. School is contemporary to us. So if I'm gonna put ancient language, ancient visual language onto something contemporary, I'm going to have to force some meaning to it. So I was thinking about, okay, if I have to uh, visually represent students, I was thinking of uh, California at the time, they had this thing called ABC Mouse, and I didn't really want to, to identify mice with, with children. So I was thinking, okay, uh, I happened to walk in Target, go down a toy aisle, and I saw Leapfrog, and I said, yes, absolutely, frogs, they are like students, if you think about it. Um, a lot of their journey is jumping on lily pads to get across the pond. So if you're in a position where you're on a lily pad and you're on water, it's unstable. You're trying to find your balance, just as a student would within their journey. And you're cr trying to cross the pond just as they're trying to get uh, achieve their um, degrees. So over here we have um, the students represented in, in the frogs. Also, um, in the corners, too, are uh, flowers. Um, the chance for these students to bloom. I always try to work with the confidence and motivation of Native American students and, and express them to be who, who, who they truly are to be, to bloom into the flower that they want to be. Um, within the corner here, the corners are uh, faculty and staff. They're seeds. 
So these are seeds in here because we're the ones planting the knowledge and these seeds are growing roots and these roots uh, surround uh, these students because I really like to stress to educators too is that as teachers and faculty and staff, we're the protectors of the students. So are we doing our job, you know, doing that and making sure that they have what they need? Um, and up top, uh, I hate to call these teepee designs, but they do look like teepees, but for this case, um, they're uh, places of worship, but a lot of uh, conversation that we have within Native American education is, um, we'll use the term like uh, education is sacred or education uh, is ceremony. So these uh, TP looking designs express uh, colleges and there's boxes for the generalized It takes four years to, to get a degree and they're all created by lightning um, and connected together because um, amongst all these tribal languages, the way that we all end our prayers is that we're all related and we're all connected. So thank you.